the winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. Now you look at the Giants at 19, and you're thinking defensive end, you're thinking linebacker, you're thinking offensive line, somewhere in that mix. Giants could use help at a number of positions, but if you're the Giants, the most logical pick here was something on the offensive line, specifically tackle slash guard. You need a guy that's versatile. You need really a right tackle. And if you're the Giants, Justin Pugh is sitting there. I wasn't a big fan of getting a guy like Pugh at 19, but by all estimations, this is a good pick. I think he's more of a guard in the National Football League, but people seem to think he can play tackle. It matters. Your arm length and all that stuff, that matters. People try to downplay it and say, look, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Because if you can't get your hands and extend them and get them on the pads of a rushing defensive lineman, if they get to you before you get to them, it's trouble. Because if they get their hands up under your pads and jack you up, you're on skates and you're bumping into the quarterback. Next thing you know, your quarterback's going down. Whereas if your arms are long enough to extend and get that defensive lineman off balance, if you're able to punch him and get him off balance, you've won. You've won half of the battle. And Justin Pugh isn't able to do that consistently because of the short arms. I thought he's more of a guard in this league. And at 19, I don't know if a guy that's the third best guard available or the fifth best tackle in the draft at 19 is good value. But the Giants drafted him anyway. Justin Pugh, guard slash tackle, a utility guy out of Syracuse. Solid pick. But again, I wasn't as sold on the pick as other guys were, but it's a solid pick by the Giants. Nonetheless, you look at 20 and the Chicago Bears. And I was fooled because I thought the Bears were going to go defense here with this pick. And, yeah, they could use an offensive line upgrade, but what do you do at 20? I mean, we just took another guy off the board. If you want to consider him a guard, that's the third guard off the board. If you want to consider him a tackle, that's the fifth tackle off the board. So either way, you're starting to go reaching for stuff at 20 if you're looking offensive line. So here, you just got to go somewhere else and get value. The Bears said, no, we're getting what we need. And when you go doing that, you water down your roster. Bears go and get Kyle Long, tackle slash guard out of Oregon. He's got the bloodlines. We know Howie Long, Hall of Fame dad, Chris Long, a beast of a brother in uh, St. Louis, getting after the quarterback at defensive end. So he's got the bloodlines. We'll see what he does in this league. Kyle Long, your pick at 20 for the Bears. You look at 21. And Cincinnati is sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay, they haven't worked out anything with Andre Smith, but they will. I feel confident that they will, so tackles off the board. And either way, it didn't matter because we're at what tackle now? Fourth or fifth tackle, depending on what you consider Justin Pugh to be? No way you take a tackle at 21. And the next best tackle probably on the board is Menelik Watson. I don't think he's worthy of the 21st overall selection in the draft. So you need to go elsewhere. Okay, so there's a glaring need at safety for the Cincinnati Bengals, okay? This is a safety-rich draft. So if you don't want to take a safety at 21, you don't have to. But, hey, you got the pick of the litter from any other safety in the draft. They strictly went best player available on the board. And I can't knock them for that. They draft Tyler Eifert, tight end out of Notre Dame. To me, overkill. You got Jermaine Gresham. You drafted Orson Charles. You got tight ends. But apparently, 
whatever they have on their roster, not enough. And in this day and age in the NFL, the two tight end look with two athletic tight ends that can make a difference, it seems to be all the rage right now. Everyone wants to have their own two tight end set where they can create mismatches on the offensive end. And Tyler Eifert, without a doubt, best tight end in this draft overall. One of the most athletically gifted tight ends we've seen in a while. And so he's going to come in. He's going to be right next to Jermaine Gresham out there at the tight end position. And he's going to be creating havoc and mismatches for the Cincinnati Bengals. And I thought it was a great pick, but it just surprised me because at 21, I thought the Bengals had needs to address. And there were players sitting there that would help them address them. But they decided to go in a different direction. Can't fault them for that. Best player on the board, Tyler Eifert, in their eyes, they get him at 21. You look at 22. And we come up on the Rams in their second first-round selection. And they decide to take this one. And we remember what they did with their first first-round pick at 16. They traded up to 8 to get Tavon Austin. Well, with this one at 22, they got it from the Redskins. They decide to go back in the draft. They let the Falcons trade up into the 22nd slot to get their guy. Rams trade back to the 30th overall selection. And so... Rams trade into the 30th selection, and so the Falcons come up to 22, and you're wondering, okay, who is it? Is it a defensive end or a cornerback? It's one of the two. We know the Falcons need defensive end help. They struggled in the playoffs last year, could not get pressure on the quarterback. So could it be a defensive end? Could it be someone like a Demontre Moore, a Bjorn Warner? Could it be someone along those lines? Could it be a Tank Carradine? Who could it be? Could it be a cornerback? And you had an inkling. If you're coming up from 30 to 22, it's got to be a corner. The value at 22 is a corner in my eyes. The only end coming up to 22 worth taking would be Bjorn Warner. And I don't know if that's someone you want to give up draft picks for. It had to be a corner. And so you knew it was a corner. So then you started trying to whittle it down in your head, okay? There's only two corners that could come off the board here at 22. It's either going to be Desmond Trufant or the big, long corner out of Florida State, Xavier Rhodes. And so if you look at the Atlanta Falcons, you say big, physical, long, cover two type of zone coverage corner really doesn't fit what the Falcons are trying to do. They're more of a man team. They do play some zone coverage, do give you zone looks, but they play a lot of man coverage as well don't know if a long guy like Xavier Rhodes fits the bill there. It's It's got to be Desmond Trufant, and that's exactly what it was at 22. Falcons move up, get their guy, Desmond Trufant, corner out of Washington. I think he's a perfect fit for what the Falcons want to do after losing Brent Grimes in free agency and essentially having your cornerback situation mixed up because you don't get Brent Grimes back. You also cut ties with Donta Robinson in free agency in the offseason. And so you're down to Asante Samuel as your one guy that you can count on. You got to go get someone else. Desmond Trufant is that guy. Great pick for the Falcons at 22. Love the move. Thought it was a move that needed to be made. If you got a guy that you want to get. And at 30, I don't think Desmond Trufant would have been there. And they realized that. They came up and they got him. So you look at 23. And this is the first of the two picks by the Vikings. And without a doubt. At 23, this is the best value in the first round because the Vikings, they had their mind blown at 23. I don't know if you remember the Big and Strips commercial. Some of you might be too young to remember it. Some of you, this might be right in your wheelhouse, but you remember the commercial with the dog. Gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta go get it, gotta get it. It's a big, 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 it's big. And he was going after the bacon strips. And it was little bacon strips for dogs. It was a snack. It was called bacon strips. And they were like, it's Biggin! And they were, they were going crazy. The dog was going crazy. And that's how the Vikings were at 23. They were like, come on, gotta have him, gotta have him. Come on, don't, don't, want, to take, don't, don't want to take him, don't want to take him. It's Sharif Floyd! And they wanted him so bad. And they were like, please let him fall to us. He's falling this far. Please let him fall to us. They weren't going to trade up to get him. But they said, look, if he continues to free fall, we're going to get the steal of the first round, in their estimation. Because I think that him being there at 23 changed the whole mindset of the Vikings in the first round. Because I think they were going to go the route of, hey, let's get the linebacker. Jasper Brinkley has moved on to Arizona. We need a middle linebacker. Let's address that. Then let's get a receiver. 
or vice versa. Let's get the receiver and then get the linebacker. Either way, I thought that in the first round, the Vikings had a one-track mind. And when Sharif Floyd fell to them, it just changed their whole game plan and their outlook on everything. He, he probably was the best player available on their draft board, number one, left in the first round. So that's number one. Number two, it also fills a need because Kevin Williams is getting up there in age. And so you need that guy to come in and kind of be the new anchor on that defensive line. And also, it's great value at 23. What is this guy still doing here on the board at 23? He was rumored for months to go to the Raiders at three. Okay, the Raiders trade out of three and go to 12. He's going to 12 at the Raiders. Well, he doesn't go to 12. Okay, someone like the Panthers will take him at 14. No, the Panthers don't take him. Okay, someone like the Cowboys at 18 will take him. No, the Cowboys don't take him. Wow, this guy actually fell to me at 23. Gotta have it, gotta get it, gotta go, get it, get it. It's Sharif Floyd. And, and that's how it went down. The Vikings absolutely had their mind blown at 23. With Sharif Floyd being there, they make the selection. It's a great move. To me, without a doubt, best value in the first round, hands down, no questions asked. Because this guy wasn't supposed to be there at 23. He was, and he's a really good football player. The Vikings are getting a guy that's highly motivated now. He was upset. You could see it on his face. And even though he kept this cool, in, in so many words he said, I'm going to show the other teams that passed on me what they're missing. And so the Vikings are absolutely getting a steal at 23 in the form of Sharif Floyd, defensive tackle out of Florida. So you look at 24. And this was one of those picks that, I was on the fence about. I really wasn't in love with the selection. We're going to see. Only time will be able to tell if this was a good move or not. But the Colts select defensive end Bjorn Warner out of Florida State at 24. And they're moving to a 3-4 defense. They played it last year for the first time. And Chuck Pagano is there, the head coach. He's bringing his 3-4 system from Baltimore. They implemented it last year. They didn't have quite the pieces that were necessary to make this defense flourish. They went out in the offseason and made an abundance of moves to try to bolster this 3-4 defensive look. But And look, every team in the league plays a base defense, but they also play multiple looks. So you'll get 4-3, you'll get 3-4, you'll get nickel looks, you'll get 4-6. You'll get all kinds of different looks. So I don't want to just put the Colts in a box and say, hey, they're playing a 3-4. Bjorn Warner doesn't fit, but... That's their base look. And they drafted Bjorn Warner to get after the quarterback. I'm not sure if this guy... I know he's not a five-technique defensive end in this league. I can assure you of that. So they didn't draft him to be that. They drafted him to be an outside rush linebacker to get after the quarterback. This is a guy that's never had his hand out of the ground. He's always had his hand in the ground. He's going to have to make the conversion. Now, you say, well, look, there's plenty of players that have done that in the league. You look at a guy like Demarcus Ware. You look at... Ryan Kerrigan, Brian Arakpo, Alden Smith. These are all guys that have made the transition from hand-in-the-ground defensive end to stand-up outside linebacker. And that's fine. But you also have to take into consideration that they all had the body type and the physical athletic gifts to do so. I'm not sure if Bjorn Warner is that type of guy. We'll see. I don't think he's a natural you know, guy that can drop into pass coverage. I don't think he's a guy that is explosive enough to get pressure off the edges standing up. We'll see, though. I think he can get pressure on the quarterback. I think he's going to be a solid guy. I don't know if he's going to play the run as well as you want, set the edge. I've got questions about this pick. We'll see how it turns out for the Colts, but solid pick. I won't knock it until I try it, and I want to see what it looks like in Indy at 24, beyond Warner defensive end from Florida State. So then you go to 25. And so then you go to 25, and it's the Vikings' second first-round selection. And the Vikings have had their mind absolutely blown away at the fact that Sharif Floyd was sitting there at 23. So they had to select him. It changed the whole outlook of their first-round draft because they probably had this thing playing out a certain way in their minds. And by the time Sharif Floyd came to them at 23, everything that they had thought about before went out the window. We've got to draft this guy. It changed their whole strategy in the first round. So now they're at 25. And there's another guy sitting right there for the taking that I don't think they expected to be there. And Xavier Rhodes, corner out of Florida State. Now, look, there were several teams earlier in this draft that needed a cornerback. And not everyone was going to get D. Miller. 
And so, after D. Milliner, this was supposed to be the consensus second best corner in this draft. Now, look, it's all in what your cup of tea is. We saw the Falcons trade up to 22 to get their guy. So, in their minds, the second best corner in this draft, maybe he was the first, was Desmond Trufant, corner out of Washington. So, everyone has a different flavor. But a lot of people were talking about Xavier Rhodes going very high in this draft. Miami needed a corner, of course. We saw what the Dolphins ended up doing with their pick. But they needed a corner. San Diego could use a corner. Tennessee could use a corner. Pittsburgh could use a corner. There were a lot of teams out there that could use cornerback help. We saw the Falcons trade up. They needed a corner. So there were a lot of teams that could have gotten a guy like Xavier Rhodes. Hey, heck, the Lions and the Cleveland Browns need a corner. So there was no way the Vikings could have predicted that Xavier Rhodes would still be there at 25. So here's another instance of the Vikings drafting and saying, wow, this is another guy that we have pretty high on our board that is just sitting there waiting to be selected. How can we pass on this guy? We can't. So they take him. So again, Vikings have their minds set on doing something else, realize that this is the best value possible in the first round for us. How can we say no to this? It's like someone giving you something for free. You need it. You want it. And it's free. How can you say no? <laughs> Who says no to free stuff that isn't going to get them into trouble? And in this case, this pick at 25 isn't going to get the Minnesota Vikings into trouble. So they make the selection and take Xavier Rose, cornerback, out of Florida State. Long 6'1", uh, frame, a very good press coverage type of corner, great in zone coverage. I think he's going to make a great cover two corner. We know Leslie Frazier is from that cover two school of thinking. And so it's going to be a lot of cover two for this guy. And I think he fits well in that kind of scheme. Get up in the receiver's face, give him a little jam at the line of scrimmage, and then get his eyes on the quarterback and see if he can make some things happen. Good pick by the Vikings. And again, more value for the Vikings late in the first round. So you go to 26. And the way that everything is unfolded in this draft, and you say, okay, Green Bay, here you are. There's been only two safeties taken off the board. And now you're looking around and there's been no running backs taken. So if you want a running back here at 26, there for the taking. You get the best one in the draft in your eyes. You also look around and you say, okay, what else do the Packers need? They could use some more help up front in that defense and bolster that front seven. But is that a pressing need? And then you look back at the Packers last season and how they lost games, and you say, yeah, Adrian Peterson gashed them twice. Frank Gore gashed them twice. And you say to yourself, okay, yeah. Colin Kaepernick ate them up in the playoffs. So did Frank Gore. You look at the Adrian Peterson games, and you realize, yeah, they had a problem stopping the run last year up front. So they say, okay, we need to address that more so than running back, more so than safety. Let's take Dayton Jones, defensive end out of UCLA. I think this is a great fit. To me, he's the prototypical five technique in this league. Good pick by the Green Bay Packers. I like his upside. I think Dayton Jones can be a star in this league. I think this is a great fit for the Packers and Dayton Jones. I like the pick. I like the value. I think it's a great move. All the way around at 26, Dayton Jones to the Green Bay Packers. You look at 27, and the Houston Texans are sitting there. And Andre Johnson has made no bones about it. I would love some help at receiver. And when your star receiver says that after years of not saying anything, you know it's time to help that man out. And so by Andre Johnson basically planting that seed a week before the draft saying, yeah, I would love to get a receiver to help me. Love it. Love it. If you're the Texans, you got to go ahead and address that right then and there. I was thinking they could use a defensive tackle. You know how I feel about having Sean Cody at the nose tackle for years, getting away with him in the 3-4 defense. Should have been illegal in, in certain states. And so he's no longer on the football team right now. I'm thinking, okay, defensive tackle is definitely the way to go in the first round. Sylvester Williams is sitting right there for you to select. Why not? 
Then I thought, yeah, they could also use a right tackle. A guy like Menelik Watson is sitting there. Or you could go the route of receiver, which you've been neglecting for years. And they decided after Andre Johnson said what he said, and, and Dre isn't a guy of many words. And so when Dre comes out and says, yeah, I'd love some help, you got to give him some help. And so the Texans heard him loud and clear and decided to go draft him some help in the form of DeAndre Hopkins, receiver out of Clemson. I love the pick. Some people thought that Hopkins wasn't worth this pick at 27. I like to think that DeAndre Hopkins is a perfect complement to Andre Johnson. Now, look, would you have liked the guy with a little bit more top-end speed? Sure. But to me, you're looking for a guy that's going to catch the football no matter where it is. I thought the Texans struggled last year when Matt Schaub wasn't throwing the football directly to guys. And you got to catch the ball over here. You got to catch it up here. You got to catch it down here. And guys struggled when it wasn't Andre Johnson or Owen Daniels. They struggled catching the football. We saw it in the playoff game versus the Patriots' first possession. A pivotal point in the game. Schaub throws a perfect pass to James Casey. goes right through his hands. And that would have been a touchdown. Instead, they had to settle for a field goal. And they end up losing the game. Look, they didn't lose by four points. But plays like that can make or break your game early on. And they need help. They need more receiving help. DeAndre Hopkins is a guy for me that has a catch radius out of this world. If you throw it in his vicinity, anywhere in his area, Cody's going to catch it. Big hands, a lot of reach, long, athletic. And if you're not careful, he'll run by you as well. And so I like the pick. I thought it was a great move. I thought it was the perfect pick for what you're trying to do in Houston right now. Of all the receivers left on the board, I thought that was the guy that could complement Andre Johnson the best. And I like the pick, DeAndre Hopkins, receiver out of Clemson at 27. So you look at 28. Denver goes beef up front. Sylvester Williams, defensive tackle out of North Carolina. Solid pick. Broncos need help up front stopping the run. I thought they made a pick early on last year. Derek Wolf out of Cincinnati thought that was a solid pick. They're looking to bolster this front seven. They do it with Sylvester Williams. Sure, they went in free agency and got the big run-stuffing defensive tackle Terrence Knighting from the Jacksonville Jaguars, but you can never have enough in this league. And I think that Sylvester Williams is a good, solid pick at 28 for the Denver Broncos. Great value at that point in the first round. Good pick by the Broncos. You look at 29, and the Patriots are sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay, defensive end is coming off the board here. The Patriots are going to find a way to get a guy and shine him up, someone that no one else wanted, like a DeMontre Moore. Put him opposite of Chandler Jones, and these guys are going to be one heck of a duo for the next five to seven years. No one else wants DeMontre Moore. Here comes the Patriots to clean him up, save the day. Patriots said, nope, we're doing what we normally do. We do it the Patriot way. We're trading back, collecting picks. We're robbing someone of their draft or future drafts. We're doing that now. We're going to trade out of the first round, allow the Vikings to come back into the first round. And the Vikings didn't have a choice. <laughs> their minds, I told you, their minds were blown. Just blown away. Blown to smithereens. Because they didn't expect Sharif Floyd to be there. That was number one. That kind of just sent their whole draft into overdrive. They, they didn't know what to do at that point, except draft him. And they said, look, we're just going to go with the flow from here on out. Sharif Floyd is here. We got to take him. And now everything else that we were thinking we were going to do is done. And they wanted a receiver. But after getting Floyd and then turning around and Xavier Rhodes is there, they're like, hey, we got to take this guy too. So their minds were blown. They didn't get the linebacker that they wanted yet. They hadn't addressed receiver. And Cordell Patterson was still sitting there. And at 29, they said, look, we were going to take this guy either 23 or 25 until guys that weren't supposed to be there were there. Now we got to take this guy. He's still sitting there. We can't let this one go to waste. They trade it back into the first round with the Patriots. Patriots come out. Vikings come up to 29. Get Cordell Patterson, receiver out of Tennessee. Here's another guy. Great value. That was supposed to go top 15. I mean, the talk of the first two months of the draft before it got underway. This guy is explosive. A lot of upside. Yeah, there's a lack of production there because we only saw one year of production at Tennessee. It came from a JUCO. So we're not sure what we're getting here. We don't know if this guy is a consistent football player or was he a one-year wonder. There were question marks, but you got to know that the talent is there. And so 
he was speculated to go as early as eight to Buffalo. Now, a lot of people didn't see that happening, including myself. I didn't see him going to eight, you know, to the Bills, maybe nine to the Jets. That was a possibility. Once they got that second first round pick at 13, I thought, man, he could come off the board as early as 13 to the Jets. If not 13, he could possibly go to Carolina, even though I already knew the thinking of Dave Gettleman. Maybe he could be an option at 14 for Carolina. He's definitely in play at 17 for the Steelers. And so there were so many different ways this thing could shake out. I mean, there are a lot of teams sitting there that could use a guy like Cordell Patterson. Bills traded back from 8 to 16. We knew the Rams were going to be in the market for a receiver as well. And so a lot of teams sitting there that could have selected Cordell Patterson. And no one bit the bullet. I mean, you also look at the Bengals. They took best player available, and their eyes was Tyler Eifert. That could have easily been Cordell Patterson to go across from A.J. Green. But instead, it's the Minnesota Vikings trading back up to 29 to get a guy like Cordell Patterson. Great value. Again, without a doubt, the Vikings got the best value in the first round, getting the guys that they got at the picks that they got them at. There's no doubt about it. Cordell Patterson has the ability to be a number one receiver in this league. But right now, they're going to ask him to be a complimentary piece to Greg Jennings. And I think that's a perfect role for him coming into this league early on. The pressure is not on him to perform as a number one. Just go out and play good, confident, solid football at the number two spot. And then you can gradually work your way up into that number one role when Greg Jennings can no longer shoulder the burden of being a number one. That's when you step in and you guys reverse roles. Jennings is now the two option and you're now the one. That's how the Vikings hope this thing plays itself out. But either way, you get yourself a really good football player. Now, again, this is a boomer bust proposition. This guy could be one of the best receivers in the league in five years, or he could be just another ordinary Joe Schmo at the receiver position in five years. We have no idea how this thing is going to turn out. But if you're the Vikings, it is worth the risk at 29. Great selection by the Vikings coming back into the first round to get him. You look at 30. And remember, the Rams traded out of 22 with the Falcons, traded back to 30. So now they're here, and they select linebacker Alec Ogletree out of Georgia. Great value. Once again, this is a guy that should have went in the top 20. But because of the -the off-the-field issues, this guy slid down to the back half of the first round and easily could have went into the second round if not for the Rams. Now, this is great value. But what you have to ask yourself is, A, is he mature enough to handle the success of being a National Football League player? Because... The surroundings and the situations are only going to get worse. They're only going to be amplified with more money. So is this guy someone that you can trust? That's A, off the field. And B, we know he's an athletically gifted player at the linebacker position. But does his skills translate to the National Football League? We know he's extremely gifted. But he's light. And you're asking him to either play middle linebacker. And I think he's more naturally a will outside linebacker over the tight end. What are you going to ask him to do? And can you ask him to be consistently good at that position? So there's question marks there. I think he can answer them. But again, only time will tell. Will this guy allow the distractions off the field to derail his career? Or will he be a reformed guy and come in and be a heck of a football player for the St. Louis Rams? We'll see. But it's a great pick for the Rams at 30. You look at 31. Biggest head scratcher of the first round. Okay, Cowboys trade back. Remember. 49ers were at 31. They wanted Eric Reed safety out of LSU. Cowboys are sitting there at 18. They flip-flop the picks. Cowboys go back to 31. 49ers get their man at 18. Cowboys are now at 31 on the clock. And they select Travis Frederick, center, out of Wisconsin. Wow. (laughs) Total mind blow. Did not see that one coming. And if anyone did... You are much better than I am because I did not see that one coming at all. That was a total head scratcher. And uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Let's just move on to the next selection. 32. Last selection in the first round. Baltimore Ravens. And I thought this was going to be a pick that someone would come up and snag to get a quarterback. No one was biting that bait. I thought the teams in the first round did a great job of not reaching for quarterbacks. They just all sat back and said, you know what? Let's all come to an agreement that we won't reach for quarterbacks in this draft. And I think everyone said, okay, we're we're fine with that. If you don't select one out of place, I won't. And so 
I thought everyone just allowed the quarterbacks to come to them. And this was the type of draft to do exactly that. I thought that everyone did their job. So the Ravens were sitting at 32. What do you need? You need a safety. What else could you use? Well, you could probably use another linebacker. You got Manti Teo sitting there. Brown is still there. Mentor is still there. So you've got linebacker choices if you like. Maybe you want to change DeMontre more into an outside linebacker that's getting after the quarterback. He's sitting there. What do you want to do? You you want to get a receiver? Anquan Bolden no longer there. There's value here at 32 at receiver. No, I'll just take a safety. Matt Elam out of Florida. Put him next to a guy that we just got in free agency and Michael Huffin. Feel good about what we've just done. Bernard Pollard isn't there anymore. Neither is Ed Reed. Matt Elam is more in the mold of a Bernard Pollard. And so you get a guy that's an imposing figure back there. Look, he's not a huge guy. We're talking about a 5'10", 5'11", at max safety. So not really the size you're looking for at the safety position. But that doesn't matter when you're talking about a guy willing to lay the number. This guy is an enforcer. And he's going to come up. And he's great around the line of scrimmage. I think he's not given enough credit for his ball skills and playmaking ability when in coverage. Is he the fastest? No. But will he make a play on the ball if you give him the opportunity to? Yes, he will. And I think the Ravens saw that out of him, saw the fact that he's the guy that will hit you in the mouth, but he will come up and make plays on the football. And they took Matt Elam at 32 at the last pick in the first round. And so that rounded out the first round. So let me get to a few things and then we're going to get out of here. So for me, best first round of all teams, Minnesota Vikings. It's no doubt about it, no question. They got the best value in this draft, or at least in the first round with their picks. They got three of them, and all of them, you could argue, were definitely slated in mocks all around the world to go earlier in the draft. They slid, they fell, and the Vikings were the recipient of some really good football players at the back half of the first round. There's no doubt in my mind the Vikings had the best first round. So you look at the best trade. This one for me is tough. I like what the Dolphins did. I thought that was a really ballsy move by them, but it's got to be the Rams getting Tavon Austin. That was their guy from the outset. They wanted him. They needed him, and they had to have him, and they needed to go up to get him, and they went and did so. I think the more ballsy of the two moves was the Dolphins, but the best to me is Tavon Austin for my money. You look at what I call my Scooby-Doo moment. And there was two of them for me. And the first one for me, let's just put them together. The, the, the Scooby-Doo moment for me was 20, Cal Long and the Bears, and 31, Travis Frederick to the Cowboys. And what I mean by Scooby-Doo moment is when the pick was made, I went, hmm? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't know <laughs> what was going on there. I mean, who saw Kyle Long being selected at 20? And look, I'll let the Bears skate with that when they need offensive line help. But the Cowboys trading back at 18, they could have gotten a defensive tackle that could have helped them. They could have gotten a safety. At that time, only one safety had been selected. Both positions of need for them. Instead, they trade back and take a center that many people had a late second or early third round grade on. Really? Not buying the logic there. And, it, and that funny part for me was they show the Cowboys um, war room and they're all excited. Ah, they're climbing. Ah, we just got to get it. I'm like, you guys just don't get it. It's, it always seems to me that Jerry Jones is picking off of a different draft board than every, everyone else. Doesn't it seem like that to you? Like, he's just picking from a different crop of players than everyone else. Like, everyone else's draft board looks like this, and Jerry Jones' draft board looks like this. Everyone else's is straight up and down. His is going sideways. I, I, sometimes I'm just baffled at some of the things that he does, but nonetheless, that was my head scratcher. But to me, the, the, the gutsiest pick was by the Buffalo Bills. It doesn't get more gutsier than basically mortgaging your future for your head coach, your GM, and the face of your franchise on one man, E.J. Manuel. 
And that's a ballsy and a gutsy pick by the Bills. I like it. I like it a lot. And so we'll see how that works out for them. But overall, I thought that there weren't many teams that really dropped the ball. Uh, of course, I wasn't a fan of what the Cowboys did. If I had to go with a team that, I won't say lost the first round. You can't lose the first round. But questionable pick, the most questionable pick to me was, without a doubt, 31. Um, the Cowboys selecting Travis Frederick uh, Center out of Wisconsin. To me, the most best player available pick was at 21 to the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. I, I didn't really see that one coming. Tight end, Tyler Eifert. That was not a need. They could have drafted a safety at that point. They could have went in several different directions. They just took their best player available on their board, and that one kind of came out of left field. But that was a best player available pick. Definitely. And that's the definition of best player available on your board pick. And so for me, that wraps up the first round. I hope you enjoyed the draft. I know I did, especially that first round. A lot of shaking and moving, a lot of moving parts. I really enjoyed watching that first round. A lot of suspense with them not, you know, tipping the picks off to us at home. And so thought it was great. Hope you enjoyed it. That's the first round break breakdown. Just finished breaking those picks down. And now you have it. It's done. want you to be on the lookout for the individual breakdown of every team in the league and their drafts. That's going to be coming at you fast and furious. There will be two a day from here on out. Two teams being broken down each day until we're finished. So be on the lookout for each and every single team's entire draft being broken down here in the lab room. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. You are in the draft zone. Have a good one. Draft zone.